to again remind us of uh, all of the old ways of the kingdom and it's never old in the kingdom everything in the kingdom is always most blessing when it is present so you are always in the presence with the word of God the same word that worked for Abraham will work for you today exactly will work for your great great grandchildren so in the time of Abraham he was right into it he lived in the presence of the word. Oh, that was Abraham's time. And so begin to lose focus on what is most active and working today. So that's why I want to remind us as I'm often reminded, see, if you're looking for the morals of the devil, you can't find it elsewhere than John 10.10. 10. They say, really? Did you call that moral? That's his moral. If you're going to add anything to stealing, killing, destroying, you add lying. That's the devil. Although we know that literally speaking, Jesus was not in the literal referring to the devil, he was referring to the Pharisees, who of course were propagating the heart and character of their father, the devil. I'm back to First Samuel chapter 30 for our opening scripture. I will read from verse 6 through verse 8. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. But David, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Hallelujah. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the effort here to me. And Abiata brought the effort to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake that is overtake them, and without fear, you will recover all. I want to emphasize today, verse 8. So David inquired of the Lord. Hallelujah. So David inquired of the Lord. Now, let me remind you. It was of David, and it is still of David that we can say, a man that lived to fight battles. We know life is a battle. That's not what I'm talking about. His own life assignment was to fight physical battles. Of course, emotional battles, and of course, spiritual battles. But what we could see and identify with was the physical. So created to fight battles. Guess what? He never lost one. Wow. He never lost one. Did he make mistakes? Oh, yes, he did. And so there's a lot to learn from David. So a lot to learn from David. And I thought over it, and what dawned on me was looking at this particular situation in which he found himself, which would have been a total defeat. And here, he had gone to volunteer for a war, call it a battle in the war, where he was not supposed to be. But you see, 
it was kind of fulfilling. One good turn deserves another. So this man has been good to me. He's given me asylum in his territory because I am troubled and distressed in my nation. The king was seeking his life. He was running for survival. And yet, he knew the covenant he had with God. David was a covenant child of God, an incredible one. But he was running for dear life. <laughs> and so he was now hibernating, as it were, in the Philistines' territory. Now, the Philistines and the Israelites were going to war. Now you find the captain of the Israelites hibernating and hiding in the land of the Philistines. They knew him. Now they were going to war. So it was the best thing to do was to volunteer. And the king bought into it. But his war law says we're going to make this more difficult for us. This man is not just an Israelite soldier. This man is one of their warlords. This young man is dangerous. We can't trust him. His own warlords were saying. Until the king actually said, you know what? Let me hear the words and the advice of my captains. David, thank you very much. God bless you. Please go back. Now, watch this. Even at this point, God saved David. He probably would have been involved in a battle that he would have lost. Probably. Then he got a zigzag. Then he saw that, hey, he had been attacked. All the wives were gone, the children were gone. All they ever had had been taken away. What could they could not take? They burnt to the ground. So when they came, it was all they had on them that they had. The Bible tells us that the men wept until they had no more strength to weep. Then they turned against David. It's like, well, I hated him. Your troubles are too many. But see, that's man for you. They quickly forget. They forgot that the way they came to meet David, that they were terrible, they were dying, they were distressed, they were in debt, they were all men. They were almost the rejects of the society. They ran to David in the cave. They had forgotten. Now they will kill him. Now this is where I'm going, ladies and gentlemen. All the men on one side agonizing and grieving, rightly so, and will kill David. And David stood alone on the other side, going through the same pains. And in addition to what they were going through, I am the leader. I brought them here. So his pains were more. The Bible said what they could do was, hey, let's kill him. Now the question is this. Would that have brought back their wives? Would that have brought back their children? But I want you to remember that all these were covenant children of God. But the Bible tells us that David, and uses the word, but, but, which is like a departure from the ongoing, strengthened himself in the Lord. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, he was the only one there that the Bible sort of encouraging himself. But I'm not going to belabor that. I just want to pick one or two things that I see as part of what he did to encourage himself. He asked for the effort. 
which of course carried the Urim and the Tumim. But basically, he positioned himself for the presence of God. Just to do one thing, and what did he do? Inquired of the Lord. Hello, is somebody here with me? Inquired of the Lord. And I tried to put myself in his shoes. Caught up with such a situation. Will I not immediately think most of us are quick-witted? Come on, move. But moving without God can be dangerous. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, it says, he that believes shall not make haste. If truly I believe God, I will not make haste. What does it mean not to make haste? Some things call for urgent move. So what does it mean, not make haste? Not make haste, not saying that you should be sluggish and you should wait for the evil to consume you. Not make haste means don't take the first step to salvaging a bad situation without seeking God's face. As desperate, as urgent as the situation was, you saw the face of God. One minute seeking God's face will give you a lifetime of victory. I'm speaking today because I know, oh, glory be to God in the highest. Certain situations in certain lives have been waiting for this. And today, you're going to take a decisive step. And you'll get victory. In the name of Jesus. You say, why are you saying that? Because I can discern right now. In the name of Jesus. Yes, I can. So David inquired of the Lord. And what did he say? Shall I pursue? If you don't pursue, what else will you do? If God didn't ask me to pursue, he probably will frighten them, they will run back. God has many options. Men are limited in options. God is never limited in options. Please. So don't think out God to fail. Is somebody, Barakashanda, is somebody hearing me? I mean, don't use this gift of God that we call thinking or reasoning to reason out God from your affairs. He is not gone to sleep yet and he's not dead. He will come through for you. In the name of Jesus, he will come through. I say he will come through. I say he will come through. In the name of Jesus. So there was David saying, shall I pursue? The natural man, like I said, you say, why should I be asking, shall I pursue? Pick your guns and bows and arrows and go after them. Where are you going after them? Where do you know they've gone to? Even if you say you know their road, okay, fine. They go this way. How do you know whether they were going this way or they were coming this way when they attacked? It will be a disaster if they've gone this way and you are busy pursuing that way. You will never meet them. But let me say this to you in the name of Jesus. Whatever has been pursuing you, today you will pursue. You will begin to pursue and you will definitely overtake in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, in the name of Jesus. Say it again, in the name of Jesus. I will surely overtake and I will recover all. In the name of Jesus, I will. Glory be to God in the highest. And what else does this tell you? It's not the time to sit down and start crying. You've cried enough. It's time to seek God's face and take decisive action in the name of Jesus. So he did. And God said, surely you will overtake and without a doubt, you will recover all. <laughs> Glory be to God in the highest. But you see, the reason is this. It wasn't the first time David is doing this. This was his nature. This has been his character all along. You say, what do you mean? Let me quickly get you to go to 1 Samuel 23. You know, this is 1 Samuel 30. Earlier than this, go to 1 Samuel 23. I just want you to see something. And that explains why David was the kind of man that he was. And this time around, I'll start to read from verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah, and they are robbing the threshing floor. 
That's the character of the devil. He's a thief. He's a destroyer. Now, see, see what he's doing there? Therefore, David, what did David do? Therefore, what? What did he cry of the Lord? How did he say? He said, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, what? Go and attack the Philistines and save Kayla. Can you see that it was David's character? David had been doing this before now. See, what you've not been practicing, when emergency comes, the chances are you won't be able to move in that direction. The word of God you've not been given attention to, to obey and to act on, will become almost an impossible thing to do in an emergency. David had a lifestyle of inquiring from the Lord. And that buttresses the fact that he did not lose a battle. You can't be asking God for direction and you will fail. No. I say in the name of Jesus, no. Glory be to God in the highest. So the Lord said to him to go and save Caleb. Verse 3. But David's men said to him, listen to this closely. But David's men said to him, look, we are afraid here in Judah. Even here we are afraid. Afraid of what? Saul and the armies of Israel. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Now you can see reasoning. This is the fact. This is reasoning. Reasoning well. Here in Judah, we are scared because Saul can still reach us. And that he hasn't come is God that's been keeping us. Now you want us to go to Keilah to go fight the Philistines. He will hear. But David was not going to budge. Why? Because he had inquired of the Lord. And the Lord has said, go. Now the question now will be, are you now going to be afraid of Saul? Or be afraid of God, George. You see what inquiring does. So, verse 4 what they said made sense. So, David did what? He went back to God. <laughs> then, David inquired of the Lord once again. Come on, church, is somebody here with me? Glory be to God in the highest. I said, glory be to God in the highest. And the Lord answered him and said, arise, I said. Go down to Kayla, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. Twice, God has assured him, because twice he inquired. And David and his men went to Kayla and fought with the Philistines, struck them with a mighty blow, and took away their livestock. So David saved the inhabitants of Kayla. Remember, David himself was being hunted. It was a most dangerous expedition. But God said, Now it happened when Abiathar, the son of Haimelech, fled to David Akila, that he went down with an effort in his hand. So you can see where Abiathar now joined them. The Abiathar that will give the effort in chapter 13. He ran to him. But people were running to him. Running for their lives. Running to stay alive. Now, it was the same people that picked stones to kill him. Not a beata, but the same people. Verse 7. And Saul was told that David had gone to kill her. You see why he had to ask God? So Saul was told, now, now, because there was no way you would fight that war that Saul would not know he was the king. So Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. Hello? Is somebody here with me? Can you hear Saul calling God? David inquiring of God, and Saul saying, God has blessed me now because I'm going to kill my enemy. Who was his enemy? The anointed of the Lord. Hello, church. And Saul had followers who believed that, yes, God was with him and God was telling him and God was leading him. They were all covenant children of God. What am I saying? 
please don't delude yourself by the fact that we're all Christians, we all go to church, we're all born again. Please, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. So Saul was told, then Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand. For he has shot himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. In other words, he has trapped himself. This finally, I will kill him. And how God has given him into my hand. Which God? Then Saul called all the people together for war. To go down to kill her, to besiege David and his men. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the effort here. Isn't it amazing? They were not told how he saw God's face the first two times. But now that the priest was there with an effort, it became easier. Bring the effort. Let me use the effort. Hallelujah. Can you see, David, the tough time? Why well, I'm picking this passage to let you see the secret of David's life. It was a lifestyle for David to inquire of the Lord. No assumption. To assume for David would have meant death. Verse 9. When David knew that Saul plotted evil against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the effort here. Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has certainly heard that Saul seeks to come to kill her, to destroy the city because of me. Will the men of Keilah see what he's asking God? Inquiring. Will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, I pray, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. All right. When God tells you, don't let men deceive you. You are a man of war. You are anointed. Stay. Stay. Constantly. God said he's coming down. Uh-huh. Here's the next thing he said. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the Lord said he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men to the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver you. Ah. He came to fight for them, to save them. He did. But God said, if you wait, Saul will come. And these same people, you can, they will deliver you. So David and his men, about 600 of them, arose and departed from Keilah and went wherever they could go. <laughs> then it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah. So he halted his expedition. Come on, church. Are you here with me? David would have died here. And on the other hand, the people of Keilah would have been destroyed. David made an inquiry. God said, go. God said, go deliver them. His men said, look, it may be a dangerous move. He went back to God and made inquiry. God said, I say, go. I'll deliver them to your hand. Go save them. And then he went. And then the people told Saul, or Saul knew. And Saul said, now I've had him where I want him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to destroy him. David said, God, is he coming? God said, yeah, he will come. And when he comes, will these people now support him or come against me by delivering me? To they will hand you over to him. Wow. God didn't say move. God didn't say run. God didn't say escape. He knew he had to leave. <laughs> Glory be to God in the highest. Can you see that a lot of times we do some things very foolishly? I remember Frederick Price would preach a message. He said, Free presumption of foolishness. Sometimes we do some things when God obviously will be talking to us, but we go against it deliberately. And yet, as many as are led by the Spirit, what makes a son? He's led. Come on. It's not led by the crowd, it's not led by popularity, it's led by the word and the Spirit of God. And we all have the capacity for that, ladies and gentlemen. It's not only pastors or prophets or teachers, evangelists. Everyone born again has it. Glory be to God in the highest. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with education. But education is good. It 
gives you leverage. There are many literates that didn't go to school, but they learned to read the Bible in their native language. And God is using them mightily. You'll be shocked. Some can never read, but they'll be hearing. People read to them. So the scriptures are in their brains. And yet God will use them in the shock. But education is good. Please. Whatever God has made available for us in the physical, take advantage of it. But don't now live your life depending solely on them. Always remember the God side of things. It's just to let you know the life of David. Second Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. It happened after this. After what? After the death of Saul. Hello. Now Saul was dead. David was still inquiring from the Lord. It was his lifestyle. No assumption. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah now that Saul is dead? He didn't assume now that Saul is dead. Let me go. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. He inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said to him, Go up. Have you observed a lot of times when David asked God, he always says, Go. Maybe it was the way he to ask questions. He saw coming? Yes. Will they hand me over to him? Yes. Shall I go? Go. Maybe if I asked, shall I stay? Though Saul is coming. Maybe God would have said, don't stay. Which is exactly what it was. Uh-huh. Then David said, where shall I go up? And he said to Hebron. Okay. So David went up there. And his two wives also, Ahinoam and Jezreelites. Remember those were the ones that were captured in Ziklag? Yeah. The Camelites, yes. And David brought up the men who were with him. Every man with his household. God says, go and go to Hebron. So he brought everybody. Hallelujah. Good. So they dwelt in the city of Hebron. And then the men of Judah came and there they did what? Come on, talk to me. Come on, talk to me. It's not only to avoid trouble or to deliver you from trouble, it will hand you over your blessings. Inquire of the Lord. Glory be to God in the highest. I'll give you one more example. Second Samuel chapter 5, from verse 17. Now, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed them, wow. See, the thieves never come but to steal, to kill, to destroy. Can you see? He is always plotting destruction. He just wants to cut you down. I like the way it is put in some modern translations. Say the only reason he will come to be your friend is because he wants to destroy you. So discern your friends. Ah. The spirit of God is a discerning spirit. The Holy Ghost discerns God. He discerns the devil. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of creation. He is the king of all spirits. Now, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king of Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephim. So David did what again? It was his lifestyle. God, help Tyro. In the name of Jesus, help me more. Help me, help me, help me. Will you remember in Isaiah chapter 11, it said, Jesus will never judge by the sin of the eyes, nor the hearing of the ears. He will only judge and do things as he hears and he sees the Father. Inquire of the Lord. The fact that the whole world is doing does not mean anything. Ask God. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Come on, everybody, you know what God is there? Go up. Now you can see that when it comes to evil of the devil, a lot of times it's a confrontation that it will stop him. But don't assume that it's by your power. And the Lord said to David, Go up. For I will doubtless. It's the same way it sounds all the times. And let me say to somebody here today, 
it does not matter how bad the situation is. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you are responding with the testimony. I say you are responding with the testimony. In the name of Jesus, no matter how much parties the devil has heard over your defeat, seeming defeat, you will laugh last. You will celebrate last. You will see the end of the devil in the name of Jesus. Everywhere they are planned to see your end, you will see their end. I say in the name of Jesus. He said, go up. For I will not let deliver the Philistines into your hand. Glory be to God in highest. Okay, 22. Then the Philistines went up once again and they brought themselves in the valley of Rephim. That one, David had dealt with them. So they went back again. Therefore, David again did what? That first time he wiped them out. The first one said, Shall I go, go up? Then they went back again. He asked the Lord, Just go again. He dealt with them. The same place. He's gone the first time. He won. Then he comes the second time. He didn't say, God always said, No, no, no. He went back to ask. <laughs> Hallelujah. I say glory be to God. Second Samuel 21, 1. Now there was famine in the days of David for three years. Now he was king. Saul was gone. He was king over the whole Israel now. Saul was gone for three years. Year after year. Famine, famine, famine. He said this was anomaly. This should not be. There's certain things in your life that should not be. I'm sure you are going to question it today. In the name of Jesus. Ha! If you are the one I'm talking to, shout amen. Oh, I feel the fire. And David did what? When he saw that, what did he do? He inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered. It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house. Because he killed the Gibeonite. What is it that the devil is hiding or secretly is hiding? He's so beclouded, you don't see him, and he's eating your bread. He's attacking your life. He's attacking your home. He's covered with light, and he's punching you and cutting you down. Today, the veil shall be taken off your eyes. In the name of Jesus. Why? You say, God, why this? Yet the God that keeps covenant a mercy. Thousand generations. So what's going on? Psalm 27 from verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat of my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Open your mouth and say they stumbled. Say it again, they stumbled and they fell. They will never stop stumbling. They will never stop falling. In the name of Jesus. Available. Look at three. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Uh -huh. Though war may rise against me, in this will I be confident. In what will you be confident? One thing I have desired of the Lord. And that will I seek. Let the armies mount up. Let the war be coming. There's one thing, first of all, that matters. There's the topmost priority in my life. Not the armies, not the war. And what is it, David? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life. Doing what? Beholding the beauty of the Lord. And to what? Inquire. In this temple. Now you can see. How David got to strengthen himself? He was a lifetime practice. Some of that happened before the first time I 30. David inquired of the Lord. So the question is, so why do you inquire? Why do you inquire? For many reasons. Just two reasons I'll give to us. Number one, it's a command. Where's your command? Come on, Proverbs 3 verse 5. Trust in the Lord. With all your heart. It's not a suggestion, is it? And lean not your understanding. The men leaned on their understanding. David inquired of the Lord. The difference was clear. Had David inquired of the Lord, he would have been killed that day. 
I'm sure when they saw him putting on the effort, they moved back. They waited for him to finish. They had enough respect for God to allow him to finish. They heard him talking and they heard him saying, this is what God is saying. <laughs> Glory be to God in the highest. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not your own understanding. That's the problem. A lot of times, that's the problem. Our understanding is informed by the internet today, by Instagram and Facebook. It's okay. Beautiful platforms. Thank God for Facebook. Thank God for Instagram. Thank God for Twitter. Thank God for LinkedIn. Thank God because they make life easy, honest. They do. Glory be to God in the highest. But hey, you go there with who you are. You go there with who God has made you. You go there glorifying the God that has made the difference in your life. It becomes a platform to showcase the hand of God on your life. And so helping others to find their way. It's not all these ones are following certain rituals so I can follow them. No. In all your ways, acknowledge God. Make inquiries of God. Don't assume anything. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall what? I can't hear you. Let me ask again. Did God direct David's part? All through his life? No wonder he never lost a battle. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every battle of your life, I speak it. Turn around in the name of Jesus. Thy man is weak. Glory be to God in the highest. Because it's a command. He says, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Jesus said in the book of John, he said, I do nothing except I see my father do. I always acknowledge my father in everything I do. He said, why are you marveling about the fact that miracles are happening? See, what you don't understand is when my father moved, I replicated. Even the words I speak, they're not mine. It's what I hear him say that I say. And when I say, things happen. It's a command. And that's why when I pray, I say, God, I receive grace in the name of Jesus to acknowledge you more. To inquire of you before I move. It's natural to be presumptuous. It's natural to assume that, well, just move. I mean, wake up in the morning, the first thing you do, you want to read all the news, hallelujah. You've forgotten that you have to say, good morning, God. When he wrote a book some years back, good morning, Holy Spirit. Just take that book and start reading. Holy Ghost will flood your life. I feel the fire. Who gets your first good morning every morning? That can make all the difference in your life. Number two, because it is a privilege of the righteous. You say, what do you mean privilege of the righteous? Matthew 7, 7. Ask. Jesus said it. Seek. Ask. You what? Seek. You will. Knock. It shall be open unto you. So why don't you take advantage of that? Why do you want to hit your head against the wall ten times when you can ask God? Why? Hebrews 4.16 says, hey, let us therefore come wow, boldly how to the throne of grace. For what reason? That we may obtain what? Mercy. And what? In terms of, do you have a need in your life? You have access. Ask God. John 16, 12 to 14. The Holy Ghost, the helper is with you. He will remind you of everything. He will teach you, will remind you. Yeah, come on. He will reveal things to you, things to come. It's your right. So it's a privilege. Take advantage of it. Third point. Why should I inquire? Because he's God. Why? As I persisted, he knows the end from the beginning. He declares what you can never dream of before they even begin to manifest. Before they will be born, before they will be created, he has declared their end. He knows everything. And that's why I will say to you, I say, no, forget the things of the past. Forget all your failures and your fears. Trust me! I will show you. I will lead you. I declare the end from the beginning. 
you put your hand in the hand of him who made the sea, who made the skies, who made the sun, who spread the sun, the stars, the moon. He knows exactly what he's doing. He wants to guide. He wants to lead. You cannot trust him. 